I do that? Why do I do that? So I, you just saw me jump and roll, right? And I, I spent a lot of time practicing that before. I practice falling down a lot, right? So I can, I can fall down and stand up. Right? That's easy. I've done it a lot. Does that mean you can do that? Does that mean that you could try to do that and fail and then say that doesn't work? Like, I don't know why I use that analogy. We'll come back to it. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, first, a little, a little word from my sponsor. <laughs> so I work for Pivotal, and we have a mission to transform our world software. But I also have a mission. And my mission is to transform how the world operates software. And I hope that the last you know, 10 years of my life supports this narrative. I, I've certainly tried to support this narrative. So this is, uh, I don't know, I don't like talking about myself. I don't like promoting myself. But I did some work on some open source projects. And I've been involved with uh, organizing Velocity Conference with DevOps Days and writing books about web operations. OK, so most important slide, as uh, uh, people were trolling yesterday, this is my Twitter handle. Very important. We're going to come back to that, too. And then just for, for your safety, I come in various configurations of hair and beard. So if you see me, again, I might look like a totally different monster, but I'm not the same monster. All right. So what is my, what is my core competence? Saying words about stuff. Okay, so we're going to talk about some words and some stuff. And if I had more time, I would have made a better talk. But at, at the end of the day, if you want to go talk about intermittent fasting or like calisthenics or like a bunch of these other things, Istio, Kubernetes, we can do that. But today we're going to talk about the death of DevOps. So I come not to praise DevOps, but to bury it. And according to Google, <laughs> DevOps dies every year, right? This is a, I mean, you can go amuse yourself. But, but the, the problem I think people have is, is defining what it is, and that's sort of by design. I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of, of how some of this evolved, but the, the reality is, after watching the absolute shit show that is Agile and, you know, loathing uh, scrum and despising the, the abomination that is safe, like we didn't really want to codify things. Um, so that means that you build like this system. And I'm going to try to give you my understanding of what that system is. But I also want you to realize that what we do today and what we want to call DevOps today, like that's going to look very, very different. Right? So when people say serverless kills DevOps, it's like, well, actually, if you think that, you're screwed. But you better hope the provider of that platform has some somewhere, right? And you probably want to be thoughtful about deployment and monitoring and all the rest of this stuff that you need to do to, to make it work. Like someone better care somewhere, right? And to me, that's what DevOps is. It's about caring enough to make stuff work. All right, so this is the most important DevOps stuff. People, people go back and forth. There's a pendulum that swings between technical talks and culture talks. But to me, it's really all about people, and in particular, communicating with people. So learn how to read, learn how to write, learn to speak, and then last but not least, but very important, if you want to do DevOps, you should follow me on Twitter. <laughs> you want to do this right. So we get the DevOps we deserve, right? So if you, if your source for DevOps is DevOps.com. May God have mercy on your soul. Because that's like the weekly world news of DevOps, right? If you want to do DevOps like Bad Boy, like you go do that. It's cool. But there's <laughs> there, there's better ways. And and I also wanted to put this in because I basically tried to warn you. This is from. I found it online back in the day, but I put it in really what was probably one of the first DevOps presentations I did, but at the time I called it Agile Infrastructure. 
And it's a warning. It's basically this, this cycle. It's called defined by the seat of your pants cycle. Right? So everything starts with smart people flying by the seat of their pants. Successful patterns emerge. Patterns are recognized and adopted as a process. Structures are created to drive and monitor the use of the process, which is like definitely happening now. Be careful. The process becomes painful, and then smart people reject the process. So if, if DevOps means to you like this hard codified thing about how you use Puppet, like you're you're dead. Like sorry. Uh, if it means like you're a smart person and you're gonna like get stuff done, then we're gonna have some fun. All right. So back in back in time. We had uh, Andrew and Patrick, who were, who were friends, because we met at an Agile conference in 2008. And people tell this story. They mostly tell it slightly wrong, but whatever. We met, and we, we connected. We bonded over this notion of bringing uh, Agile practices, Agile ideas to, to operations and system administration. But the word DevOps actually, in some sense, comes from this presentation. So this is a presentation that was at Velocity Conference in 2009, and I know the date because I looked it up on Twitter this morning. Uh, this was John Allspot and Paul Hammond giving a talk about how they were doing deployments at, uh, at the time it was Flickr. And this like blew people's minds, right? So this is, now this is nothing. Ten, ten points a day, like whatever, whatever. Like, people are deploying every second. Amazon's like on record the 20 years right? So this is like, but at the time, 2009, this was this was like people's heads exploded. And they had a bunch of cool stuff they talked about. And it's a great presentation. You can actually go watch it online. But in this presentation, which I was a very enthusiastic audience member, uh, I I tweeted this and said, "This is the first one." So there's a bunch of them that I tagged DevOps. But this is the very first one, and it says, "Don't." Just say no, you aren't respecting other people's problems. You know, we're looking at this thing. And then Patrick started talking to me. We'd already been talking, and I was a puppet, and I knew like this this thing was big, whatever, like this agile infrastructure at the time was really but uh, Patrick really wanted to do a conference. And I had just organized two conferences. So I organized a conference that I called Agile Roots, which is about getting back to like real agile, but that's like another hour long talk. And then I'd, I'd organized Puppet Camp. And Puppet Camp had the same format. So this was the, the first event that had the 50% volunteers and, and then 50% open space. So my motive was the open space. I think that's where the magic happened. Did anyone have any time in open space yesterday? Did anyone, did anyone learn anything or share anything? Pretty cool. This is the best. Like peers, Cooperating, communicating, talking about their 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 truths is the is the best way to move everything forward. All right, so getting into this, the essence, the element. So here we are, and it turns out the best way to improve development is to improve operations. Like this is all kind of boring and like obvious, but here we are. So the best way to improve operations is actually to improve debt. Right? And, and it's weird because you go from different DevOps communities and different DevOps events, and like that would be on a different side. So sometimes the, the communities are more ops, and sometimes there's actually more devs, and so it's like kind of this weird pendulum, but these things are really one. Right? If you actually understand and think about this as a system, like you have to solve both together. But why? Who cares? Sapphire's in the world. Blah. That's like boring shit too. Like people keep saying that. Okay, so you're gonna build a software company or you're gonna lose a summit list, right? This is transforming everything we do. And at least in 2018, if you're gonna be like fully buzzword compliance, you're gonna continuously get off microservices, or you're gonna lose a summit list, right? And then there's like all this stuff, blah blah blah, buzzwords, and this to me is really just one thing. Right? So this is all the, the dominant paradigm for how the next decade of, of software services will be delivered. Right? So this, if you try to do microservices without DevOps, like good luck. Right? If you try to do continuous delivery without solving you know, automation and monitoring and the rest of it, like, you're just 
Like, you just made your life so much harder. So, blah, blah, blah. It's actually super funny to me, and there's a bunch of dead bodies buried somewhere, uh, because I started talking about cloud native at Pivotal before there was a cloud native computing foundation, which should have rightfully been called the Kubernetes Foundation. But then, now they're like redefining it so that it includes culture. It's like, but if you don't read what I wrote, like before that, I actually already included it. So we're good. It's cool. Yeah, we'll talk about dead bodies later. So then this is my, if you've ever seen some of my other talks, or really my favorite talks that I've given, like really focus on this notion of learning, like acquiring skills, right? So like one skill that I've acquired is the ability to kind of like jump in more, right? And that's like pretty cool. But if you can't change your behavior, if you can't learn, then eventually someone's going to beat you, right? This is the only sustainable advantage. Being able to, this, is, this applies to you as an individual and, and also applies to your organization. So being able to get information and, and change your behavior and improve your, your performance is the key sustainable advantage. Everything else is, is training, right? All right, so let's come back to operations. So what does it mean to, to do operations? So this is a statement that I did not make, but I'm going to explain where it came from. So operations is a secret sauce, just not traditional operations. So for the sake of argument, we're going to revisit a classic sequence of slides that I actually did since 2009. So here's your, here's your traditional IT. you got happy developers and happy operations. We all we have even seen this movie, right? And then, and then we put a wall of confusion between them, and we force them to communicate through ticket systems and emails, and, and, and not really you know, see each other as human beings. Which tends to make people a little less happy, or I don't know, maybe you work here. Like, it could be worse, right? And, and the reality is that in a lot of cases, especially if you're following super traditional ideas about um, service management, uh, you've actually institutionalized the incentives in, in opposing directions. So you have one group who's incentivized to destabilize systems. At one group, we'll call them features, whatever. Uh, and then you yeah, have one group who's incentivized to, you know, sleep at night, right? And, and in the worst case, you've actually embedded this in your financial incentives, right? And, and I've been, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, but there, there's, there's a launch and everyone's celebrating. It's like, woo! We launched this thing that we accumulated for six months, and the devs are probably drinking, and then and then the servers are on fire, and like, the ops are getting paid. And like, yeah, this is awesome, super fun. Anyone, anyone do that? Yeah, it's awesome. So this is the secret sauce. So this is, I think this is interesting for so many reasons. So this is a historical artifact. So this is 2007 in. O'Reilly Radar, a blog post by Jesse Robbins, who was uh, at the time at Amazon. He's a founder of Chef, and he is a founder of Velocity Conference. And he was really focused on operations. And this is before Chef exists. He's talking about operations as a secret sauce. And, and I've dissected this for over 10 years now, but essentially on the, on the left side, you have traditional operations. And the argument he's making, everything in color under the graph, is the hours of time spent managing the system. And then on the horizontal axis, you, you have, it's sort of conflating time and scale. Right? So the systems are, are growing over time, because you're, you're, you know, you're, you're building your startup that's going to scale. And, and you have all this work to do, because you didn't invest in the secret sauce configuration or whatever. And on the right side, the secret sauce way, which in, in some sense, you know, DevOps isn't quite a word yet, but this is primordial DevOps, right? This is the, the cloud natives building things the way they do before there's really words for that, right? And, and this is the experience that he has as an operator inside of Amazon, talking to, you know, projecting this out to the rest of the world. So on the right side, you can, you can see that there's less toil, right? There's less work, human hours. And this is 2007, so this is kind of like 
puppets on the rise, and there's like a bunch of cool stuff happening. Blossom Conference is about to be organized for the first time, but you, like, it is even more insane in 2018. If you think about the tools that we have available and the conversations that we can have with each other and the experiences that we can share to, to drive this, this linear growth in the toil down even farther, right? And then, you know, serverless or whatever too, but whatever. So this is a quote that's also nice for the historical context. This is Werner Vogels in 2006. So this is Werner, 2006, interview. The traditional model is you take your software to the wall, the set place to develop operations, you throw it over and then forget about it. We just saw that graphic, right? That doesn't work out very well. And not at Amazon, you build it, you run it. This brings developers into contact with the day-to-day -day operation of their software. It also brings them into day-to-day -day contact with the customer. This customer feedback loop is essential for improving the quality of service. That's interesting, you build it, you run it. I actually prefer SRE model, we can talk about that too. But it's interesting to, to frame it. And every single organization went through, everything I'll call cloud native, went through this phase where operators, the first line operations is actually done by the developers, right? And then there's some platform services. And even Google with the SRE model and that separation has the developers run their own services until they deserve SREs, right? And, and that model is actually focused on driving down the operational cost to zero. It's negligible. It's not just about having these other people and going back to the old wall and like changing the titles to SRE and like now we're done. It's about this mindset, site reliability engineering. And the engineering is like key to that. So why does this matter? This is, I'm stealing this from uh, Liz the Great Google, and Liz gave a great talk about SRE, but I stole this slide because I think it frames why this matters. So this is software's long-term cost. And this is, you can go read the reference if you like, but it's basically arguing uh, in an academic paper that estimates of 49% of the total costs are incurred after the launch. This is really easy to, to like think about mathematically. If it's not free for you to run your service, and you let time go forward, then the accumulation of costs that you have to operate is eventually going to dwarf whatever cost, whatever it costs you to build it. Like that's just math. All right. So what's that loss? This is me in 2010 uh, writing a blog post about what is DevOps to Andrew. So this is 2010. There's a couple people, you know, a handful of people that wrote what they thought DevOps was, and we're having these fun conversations. It's 2010, right? So this is mine, and there's three points, and I think they, they hold up pretty well. So number one, developers and operations can and should work together. Just do it, right? Like do that. Someone should do that. Number two, system administration is evolving to look more like software development, right? So this is 2010, and in 2010, I can write against an API to provision machine. I can write against an API to configure machine. I can write against an API to monitor machine. That looks suspiciously like software development, right? I'm writing against APIs. I can use all the tips and tricks, all the tools that I've used to do software to do my system administration work, right? So I'm going to put all my configs in Git. You should be using Git, whatever. Uh, and, and I'm going to write against APIs, and everything's going to be great. And if we have the word site reliability engineering at the time, that's what I would call it. But here we are. And then number three, and this is critical, and this is why I like to come and meet people and talk about things with interesting people solving problems is that this is a global community sharing these solutions. And the, the problems that I can solve because I made friends with people like John Allspaw changed, changed the, the whole dynamic of my career, and it'll change the dynamic of your career too. So you might be a very, very smart person, and you might have Google and Stack Overflow, but there's people in this room that can help you solve whatever problems you have, and you could probably help solve other people's problems too. And that's very important. So then there's, there's my friends, John Willis and uh, David Edwards, who, who came up with this kind of, I'll, I'll call it the pillars or the elements of DevOps. And I'm actually going to focus on this for a minute, for a good chunk of this, uh, because I, I like the framing, but I, I felt like it was inactionable, and I want to try to make it actionable. So people have said this before, like this is something people have been talking about for, you know, it's, it's going on, what, eight years now since they said this? So culture, automation, lean, metrics, and sharing. And then visually it didn't have lean, but Jez added lean, and I'm going to tell you why I like lean, uh, at least for two reasons. 
by the end of it. But, but these are just words. Like, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to tell you. Duh. But, but a lot of times when you see DevOps days presentations, or you see Velocity Conference presentations, you have, you have startups, or you have you know, the Enterprise Summit people, and everything's like, amazing. It's like, we did this thing, and it works so well. It's like, so awesome. It's like, pandas vomiting rainbows. Ooh, DevOps! Ooh. It's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll come back to the pandas. <laughs> So what does that mean, you know, culture automation, what am I supposed to do now, right? So I like models. I like to make math models, and I like to make conceptual models. And this is a model that I'm stealing from Chinese medicine. So this is the five elements of Chinese medicine. And it's a very interesting system, and like, I wouldn't pretend to be an expert, but I think it's got this interesting idea that you have these things that interact with each other. So in the five elements of Chinese medicine, there's a constructive cycle where the elements reinforce each other, and there's a destructive cycle where the elements destroy each other, right? And there's other models, and like people do interesting things like mapping this model to, but there's, there's like this interesting thing going on in terms of the flow of stuff, right? And all the cultures have different models, but it's sort of all the same too, if you look deep enough. So I'm going to take and put the five elements onto this model. And, and then we're going to talk about it. So culture. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> okay. Now what? What does it mean for lunch or dinner? Like, what, what, what am I supposed to do, Peter? I don't know what to do. That didn't help me. So if you've been reading the stuff, right, like the DevOps handbook, whatever, the people have started talking about the Western topology culture. And this is very interesting. And I'm going to borrow, first we're going to talk about this for two seconds, but I'm going to borrow this model and try to apply it to the other elements as well. So the, the, the key takeaway of this model, and like this literally deserves like its own whole day lecture, right, to like talk about the culture stuff. Each one is, is like literally a whole day. So, on the left side, we're going to agree that this is bad. You can tell it's bad because it's called pathological. <laughs> and then in the middle, it's a little better. And then on the right side, we're going to hopefully agree that this is better. Better than bad. Right? So in your organization, most, most people in especially enterprise, do not work in generative cultures. I'm just going to say that. Sorry. And in the best case, they're bureaucratic. Right? So there's a lot of work to do. And there's a lot of reasons why this happens. And, you know, obviously we can't fix all of them. There's like another talk I should be giving about how you need to become leaders to like actually change culture. Like you want to be in a different culture, like you should probably start one, right? So I think we can agree though that low cooperation is worse than high cooperation, hopefully. And that shooting messengers is probably not as good as like training messengers. So just a really quick funny aside, I was in China and I used this slide and they like didn't understand what messengers shot. And then they're like, oh, you mean kill them? <laughs> because if you shoot them, they might not die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so you gotta be sure. You gotta be sure about your intent and the outcome of it. Who would rather work in a place where risks are shared rather than a place where responsibilities are shirked? And these are not hard, right? These are, this is like super easy. And who would rather work in a place where failure is blamed and you, you, know, you have a scapegoat and you sacrifice them versus like a you know, blameless post-mortem or I'm going to do better next time, right? This is, this is like people give talks about this stuff. This is, this is easy to agree on. So just as a, a quick framing, I feel like the biggest change, this kind of goes back to the wall of confusion thing, is about 
aligning incentives and interests, right? So if you want people to cooperate, but you set up a system where their incentives are in direct opposition, they probably won't cooperate. Just, just say it, right? Like, that's pretty easy to understand. And then the other thing that I think is key, framing and watching you know, the evolution, and maybe you don't work here, but in, in the context of the cultures that I see dominating, well, you know, we'll call them cognitive, whatever, they, they reframed IT as a weapon, right? It's a competitive advantage that they are willing to make investments in their future. It's not something that they're managing as a self-fulfilling prophecy as a cost center, right? And in the worst cases, you have CTOs, CIOs that report to the CFO. Mm. Sorry, sorry, hard to help you. All right, so let's move on to automation. And I used to, I used to say automate all the things, and I'm going to tell you why I don't say that in a minute. But now I like to add architecture because it turns out not everything wants to be automated, <laughs> and it will fight against you trying to automate it. And you can save yourself a lot of time wrestling with your favorite automation framework if you just revisit your architecture. All right, so this is me, 2009. Yeah. I mean, all the things. I got a puppet. I can solve any problem. So is this automation? Is this automation? Yes. This is a manual task with some tools. This. <laughs> this is automation. Right? I still don't like that architecture, but at least it's automated. So the point I was making a minute ago, what, how, and why you automate is as important that you do. So the, the transition from wherever you live in the legacy system to the future that you're trying to build, if you just have an automation initiative and you're trying to replace what is there with exactly what is there except now automated, you lose a huge opportunity to, to, to move yourself forward into the future, right? And so you got this, this, this robot, and he does some things, and you're like, I'm just going to put it in a container. I'm just going to let Kubernetes like, schedule it everywhere. And, and this is a very important lesson. If Tetris has taught me anything, it's that errors pile up and accomplishments disappear. And, and I think this is sort of the point you know, Donovan was making yesterday, that you should revisit your architecture. You can, you can save yourself a lot of time, get yourself on a new kind of operational curve, if you revisit those, those sins of the past, right? And, and move to the future. So I think some of you have probably been through part of this. Or you're about to. Nah. All right, so now, back to this spectrum. So this is me attempting to build a spectrum of the elements. So on the right side, hopefully, we think this is better than the left side. So in the, in the left side, we have manual work. So it's a lot of toil. It's a great word. Um, we're going to steal from our friends at Google. And in this, in this world, there tends to be catastrophic failures. And we're really, really focused on minimizing the incidents, which means we play Django with everything and we don't want to touch it. And like, if we do touch it, it falls over because we build it so poorly. And then as we get better, like we start to have you know, some focus on disaster recovery. And we can actually do that. And maybe you get smart enough to focus on the meantime to recover versus minimizing incidents. But at the highest level, the, the, the world that you know, the cloud natives live in, you're at, a, you're at a place where things are actually designed to fail. You're operating with continuous partial failure. Right? So you get to the point where you can inject faults into, into your application, into your infrastructure, and expect no service disruption. Right? And there's like a whole bunch of interesting conversations and tools uh, around this right now when you look at what's going on with the chaos engineering stuff. This is really fun um, and really useful. And you know, I, who's familiar with the chaos monkey? Right. So there's a chaos monkey. Most people need consistency monkey first. <laughs> Get consistency monkey before you like unleash the chaos monkey. Anyway. So moving on. Who's read the paper, the Borg paper from Google? Who knows what the Borg is? So I remember in 2008, 2009, when Google was using Puppet to manage 30,000 workstations and laptops, if you said the word Borg in a room with people from Google, 
they would all look at each other and then stop talking to you. Because Borg was like their secret, is their secret weapon. So this is the container scheduler solution that Google was built on that's kind of inspiring or inspired Kubernetes. But this, this is a nugget of gold buried in this paper. So you can go read the paper, it's interesting, it talks about their container scheduling and the evolution of it. And that's awesome. This is the gold. Almost every task for your board contains a built-in HTTP server that publishes information about the health of the task and thousands of performance metrics. And I guarantee you, I will bet anything you want to bet, that if you make your applications report their health metrics, that you will get more benefit from that, more operational benefit from that, than you will from the best container scheduling solution in the universe. You can clap at that. Woo! That's your goal. And no one does it. But who, who has more context about the application's health than the developer who's writing it? Certainly not the ops person after the fact, right? And, and, but at the same time, you've got to have like, this platform and this tooling to enable this, because all humans, given the choice between doing the right thing and the easy thing, easy. Moving on to metrics. Okay, so that was the segue to metrics. So we have this stolen from the site reliability engineering book. This is Google's framing for the hierarchy of site or service reliability. They call it service reliability on this page online. So the, the bottom, the foundation of this pyramid is monitoring, right? Because if you don't have monitoring, how do you know anything? How do you know what you changed was good or bad? You have no idea. You're just flying. It's not even that you don't have a, like, the instruments. You don't have a windshield. Right? You're just bumping into stuff. And, and that dovetails into something that I really hope everyone in this community will adopt wholesale, which is being able to articulate and, and quantify service level objectives. And I'm going to give you homework at the end. But this, this is pure gold from Google. The service level objectives, what they mean, how to think about them, will change your life. Because the other thing about service level objectives is it solves the incentive uh, alignment problem between dev and ops in a way that I think is very elegant. And what it does is it says, if you are below your error budget for our service level objective, which we agreed to uh, with the business, because we all agree that reliability is important, if you're below your error budget, then you as developers can deploy at will anything you want. Right? And there's like a whole bunch of things that are built up inside of um, you know, Google to facilitate that, and you might want to work on those before you try to do the diving roll. But, but that changed the game because then when you blow your air budget, you can't deploy, and now all of the priorities go to reliability. Right? So if you want it, if you want to deliver features as developers, you build reliable services, or you can't change the features. Right? This, and it just like, solves this problem in a very elegant way. And it's totally dispassionate. It's not about blaming, it's like, here's the numbers, here's where we're at, we can't deploy, and they reset every quarter. You can, re you can deploy in three months. Go fix your stuff. <laughs> so what are your objectives? I think this is, when I try to get people to talk about service level objectives, most people need a bit of education before they can have this in a meaningful way. And, and that's education for, for the, Every party, right? Ops, devs, and business people. Because business people are like, we want seven nines. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, you don't. We want 100% as much as possible. It's like, okay, well, let's break this down. Every nine costs 10 times more than the last one, right? And get, get people to the point where you actually understand the, the trade offs, right? Because everything's about trade offs. So how do you know what your objectives are and how do you know what you're meeting them? All right, so this is, my, this is my next element, the spectrum. So I'm hoping we can agree things on the left are not as awesome as things on the right. So on the left, we have no information about our systems. We SSH into everything and we run tail minus F and a bunch of terminals and we like stare at the matrix. And like, oh, that's an exception. Oh, that's a normal exception. That's a <laughs> That's a bad one. And monitoring like never gets done, really. It's, it's just on fire all the time, and it's sort of like this downward spiral into you know, the depths of Hades, whatever. As we get a little better, then 
We start to have data, maybe we have some log aggregation. We start to have monitoring, but it's a secondary consideration. Right? So we have, we have developers making stuff, and then it comes over the wall, and then we monitor it. Right? And that's, that's cool, but it's not as awesome as having the monitoring built in. Right? So, so in, the, in the cloud natives or whatever, the, the highest performing ways to do this, and the words don't matter, we going back to that, we have SLIs, and we build in monitoring from first principles. Right? So now we'll go to the next one. Next one, sharing. Let's all see pandas share stuff. Woo, DevOps days, open space. We're a global community of practice. Hopefully we're all getting better, right? And, and, and changing our behavior. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna do better, whatever that means. And this is just to make a point, but we, we go back and inside of our organization, you know, there's, and this is an oversimplification, right? So you have, you have, you don't just have devs, and you don't just have ops, right? There's like people who do JavaScript, there's people who do Java, and there's people who do whatever. And like, that's okay, and those are all like their own community in a sense, right? And they all have like different standards for what excellence means, and that's awesome. So, so what I see a lot of people doing, and I saw this, this level of trolling a, a little bit yesterday, is you take the wall of confusion and you replace it with a new silo, <laughs> right? So now you have two walls. <laughs> Woo! Don't, don't do that, please. I mean, if you get a little bit of incremental benefit from that and, and you want to have DevOps on your business card, it's like, okay, it's cool. I still love you. But I think there's a better way. And, and what I try to get people to think about, and this is sort of related to, you know, thinking about projects and products and services and, and all this is aligning what I'm going to call a community of interest. So we have each of these, each of these communities inside of our organizations. They should not be made one big pile, right? Because the other pattern I see is like, DevOps means developers do everything and operations does everything. I'm like, that is goddamn awful. <laughs> that is like literally an undifferentiated mass of people if you're going back to the biological metaphor, that is a tumor, <laughs> right? Like, let's get some structure and like understand the systems that we're dealing with. So we want to align across the communities of interest, developers, operations, business. Security is always on the bottom. Remember that, very important. <laughs> Keep going. So, so now we have another spectrum. So in the, the left side, hopefully we agree that this is worse, so we have everything's hidden, can't find anything, very strong silos, and everything is a secret, right? And then as you get a little bit more advanced, like you start to put things on a wiki, it's, it's there, you know, so it's like went there to die, but it's there, and, and you can search for it if you kind of know the right way to find things, you can find stuff. And in the highest level organizations, I feel like people, take information and they cultivate it in a way that other people can make good decisions, right? So if you just like give people, and we sort of have a talk about this yesterday with respect to monitoring, like all the information, but they can't make any sense of that. No way to make sense of that. You gotta give, you gotta give people like relevant access to it and that requires in some ways like an understanding of the problem and the alignment of interests, right? And then I also feel like the sharing inside the organization is awesome, but the sharing outside the organization is actually, in some ways, even more awesome, right? And being able to come and like share with each other is a big deal. All right, so now, the last element. I put it last. So if you're actually a student of these things, then you realize that Lean kind of covers all of them already. Lean, lean if you study Lean and the evolution from manufacturing to software, Sort of already covered all this stuff. But the thing that I like about Lean, or reason why I want to add it, is this notion of continuous improvement. Right? And, and being able to look at where we're at and try to do better. So it's not enough to just have a culture, it's always try to do better. It's not enough to have monitoring, it's always try to monitor better. Right? And then, you know, just to kind of keep with the theme, I think on one side you have people who are complacent. Hopefully you don't work there. As you get more motivated, you get a little better, but I feel like the highest performing and the teams I want to be part of are inspired. Like they love what they're doing. 
And also calms sound way better than camps. So, all right, so that's the five elements. And this is not that interesting, but it's sort of like all five together with the top being the pathological stuff and the bottom being the better stuff. But then, now that we have the elements, the interesting thing is how they mix together. Right? So you have, this, you have this notion of mixing them together. And I don't think that we can map out all these things in the way that they work. But you have pathological cultures that are fully automated. Right? You can have automation that's unwandered. I did that before. Uh, you can have metrics, but no one can really get to them to make the right decisions. You can have generative cultures, but they're, they're maybe behind in, in adopting certain tools, so they're kind of buried under their own toil. And then, last but not least, this notion of continuously improving, like what is good enough today might not be good enough tomorrow, right? <laughs> Sounds great, right? Sounds great. Everyone wants this. Everyone wants the DevOps. Here's what they really want. They want scalability, availability, reliability, operability, usability, observability, probably some more illities and idities. They want it all for free without changing anything. <laughs> without changing anything. So to make this point, I'm just going to make the text bigger. Dun, dun, dun. Without changing anything. And, and there's a reason why this happens. And the problem here, and, and people have seen this before, crossing the cows, and this is like how innovations get adopted. And, and the, the question is not, will you change? Because you will change. The question is, when you'll change? And what's your, what's your organizational and individual appetite for change? And I used to get really frustrated when I'd have conversations with people about trying to do Agile, or trying to do DevOps, and they'd say, oh, like, we already do Agile. It's like, <laughs> okay then, like you, you clearly can't deliver software, but good on you. And and the problem is that there's a transition in this adoption curve where the early adopters and innovators are actually motivated for an advantage, and then as you move into the the majority, their motivation is not the advantage, right? So they, they, they the advantage is established. People are having a success. They're publishing their metrics. At some point, it becomes legitimized. And so the new motivation for the majority is not to have the advantage, it's to be legitimate. And that's why you have DevOps on your business cards. <laughs> okay, okay, but, but if we have to change, can you tell us exactly what to do? So this is the other conversation I end up. It's like, okay, we get it, software's in the world. Tell us exactly what to do. They're like, no! I'll make it bigger. <laughs> You can't do that because it's like it's not going to stop, right? So these are going to keep coming in waves, and it's waves on waves on waves on waves, right? If you're just trying to pay attention to the DevOps tools right now, like it is overwhelming. Just like following every week, right? Let alone trying to follow over the course of years or plan like exactly how to do things five years from now. So these waves are going to crash. And you get a choice, like, do you want to be tossed and turned and drowned, or do you want to be this guy, right? Has anyone ever, ever tried to surf? So no one can tell you exactly how to surf, right? You can tell people, stand up now, you know? You can tell people, try to paddle and catch the wave and all this stuff, but it's like you can't just tell people, you have to feel it. You have to be willing and able to fall. You have to get in the water, and you have to get on the board, and you have to fall down, and it has to suck. Right? And the will to surf has to overcome the fear of falling. Right? If you can't get there, you're never going to surf. But here's a warning. Surfing is hard. I like, lived in L.A. for two years, and I tried to surf a lot, and it sucked. And I got, I got to stand up a few times, and it was amazing. But at the same time, it was like, it's definitely work, right? And here's another warning. Software is hard. And guess what? It was always hard. And when people are giving talks about pandas and rainbows, this is what it felt like to me. <laughs> it felt like mud and blood. Right? This is the, the secret sauce 
golden age of DevOps, me giving talks about all this stuff, mud and blood. And this is an actual picture of me trying to manage OpenStack <laughs> in 2007. So you had a warning, and here's your warning. And this is another person who got a warning, and this is a true story. I don't know if anyone's from Texas, but this actually happened. So this person was gonna go swim, and they said you should not swim. There was an alligator, and he said that, and then he died. He jumped in, and it's actually this guy. So with that warning in mind, I want you to understand what I expect you to go through as you, as you try to do this. All right? So this is the five stages I expect you to go through. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. You were warned. You were warned. And this is my new you know, 2018 version of what I believe DevOps is. So on the notion that software is transforming everything, software is optimizing everything, we're going to optimize human performance and experience operating software. And we're going to do that with software. And we're going to do that with humans. That's what DevOps means to me. And don't worry about the words. So no one really set out to do this DevOps thing. Right? They, no one set out to do microservices. It's like Darwinian. This is what you have to do to succeed. So don't fixate on the words, fixate on succeeding. So are you doing DevOps? Who cares? Do you have joy? Do you have ease? Do you have love? Do you have results? Right? Because software is hard, but humans goddamn harder. Right? Because you have this opposing force problem again, because humans are terrible and humans are also awesome. Right? And you are probably a human. And my favorite thing about humans is that humans can learn. But I want you to take this one little nugget, which I started planning to see in the beginning, is you haven't learned anything until you change your behavior. Like, this is super easy to prove when you're talking about music or chess or boxing or rolling, any of these things. But if you can't do the thing, then you didn't learn yet. You just collected trivia. You just collected information. Does anyone work with this person? So this is a quote. I'll just let you read it. But this quote is from the least productive person. <laughs> and then, you know, on the notion of changing, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survive, is the one that is most adaptable to change. There's no evidence Darwin ever said this. So saying the word DevOps won't fix your pathological culture, it won't fill a lack of vision and line interests and incentives. Software is creative. It's closer to art than science. Software is complex. It doesn't, it's not well behaved. Complex systems, small changes in inputs can have big changes in outputs. It's not digging ditches. And software is not running factories. Most of what people are using as their management philosophy and frameworks is rooted in industrial revolution factory work, and that is a good way to not succeed as software. It's closer to art than science, and then principles are more important than practices, are more important than tools. I was literally having a convulsion yesterday in the front row when he said products, but that's we can take that to the open space. Uh, we are tool building creatures, so let's build some tools, but the tools actually are less important. If you understand the principles, the practices will emerge, the tools you need to build are obvious, or the products you need to buy, whatever. Your mindset is more important than your skill set, it's more important than your tool set. Adapting is more important than adopting. Why you do things is more important than what you do. So this is the best methodology for delivering value. Smart, motivated people working together. The best. Everything else is secondary. It doesn't matter about software either. Like that's, that's true about anything. So this is your call to action. Be smart. Be motivated. Work together. Change your behavior. Change your behavior. Change your behavior. So that's the five elements. But now, I got a bonus. Homework assignment. So this is from the Cyber Liability Engineering book that you can get for free. 
They just published the Site Reliability Engineering Workbook, which used to be free until like a few days ago, but now you have to pay like a few dollars for it. But these three chapters, every single person should read. So there's, there's lots of stuff that Google does that you can't do because you're not at Google. And there's lots of Google-specific navel-gazing in this book. But these three chapters are solid gold. And if everyone in the DevOps community could understand these three chapters that are articulated so clearly from Google, then we'd all be better off. And, and particularly, service level objectives and eliminating foil. And then bonus, you can read the communication collaboration if you didn't read it. But that should take you like half hour. So you can read it for free. And it's also Google, Google's DevOps implementation. And if you really look at it, they kind of cover all these things, right? So that's cool. So steal it. Great DevOps steal. So with that, thank you very much. I'm not here to answer questions. I'm here to have conversations. And then I work for Pivotal. So thank you very much.